Smell. You're walking along, minding your business, when suddenly you inhale a few molecules and... It's a smell, and you recognize it. But how did it happen? In this video, we'll take a look at how your nervous system picks up chemicals from the air and converts them into concepts, in way more detail than you need to know. We'll look at the overall wiring plan, we'll zoom into each part and see how it works, and we'll even throw in a bonus separate parallel smell processing system that you may or may not have. I've also included a number of references in the video's description if you'd like to learn more. Alright, let's get into this. Overall, the smell processing system, or the olfactory system, as the scientists like to call it, is not that complicated, at least compared to other systems. Let's see if you can follow this along. First, the smell gets detected in your nose by the olfactory sensory neurons, then, the signals from those are collected in the olfactory bulb. Then, the signals from there are processed in the olfactory cortex. That's it! Compare this to hearing, for example, where you have a complicated detection organ and then multiple processing and relay steps before it gets to the cerebral cortex. In fact, the olfactory system is so basic that even in flies it has essentially the same layout and they are separated from us by 400 million years of evolution. Uh -oh. So, how exactly does this whole system detect a smell? Let's start with the cells responsible for that, the olfactory sensory neurons. These are very specialized neurons that live right on top of the inside of your nose, and they have ends that dangle in a layer of your nose mucus. There are millions of them, and if we zoom into the bottom tip for one, we'll see that in its cell wall, there are smell receptors that detect one specific kind of scent. The way it works is, this receptor has an outside part that fits only specific molecule shapes. Wrong molecules will bounce off the receptor. But the right kind of molecule will fit the receptor, and then will trigger something called a G protein which then kicks off a chain of chemical reactions that starts an electric spike, which then travels down the neuron and to the rest of the nervous system. And that's how one sensory neuron detects one specific type of smell molecule. So then, if we want to detect a variety of smells, we just add a bunch more smell detection neurons that have different smell receptors. But, we have to make sure to put only one kind of smell receptor on each neuron, otherwise we'll have trouble telling different smells apart. And that's exactly what we have in our noses. Human DNA has around 4 to 500 genes for different smell receptor types. And each of the millions of smell neurons has exactly one of these receptor types. So it specializes in exactly one type of smell. For comparison, Rats have about 1200 receptor genes, and fruit flies have 60. So, the neurons have just detected some smell in your nose. And now what? Now we need to collect these signals, clean them up, and forward them to your brain. And that's exactly what the olfactory bulb is for. The way the olfactory bulb works is that it has thousands of little balls called glomeruli, a single one of them is called a glomerulus, and each one of these glomeruli collects connections from the neurons that have the same smell receptor. So each glomerulus is responsible for one specific odor. And then, from each glomerulus, we have a bundle of projection neurons that head toward the brain. But the olfactory bulb doesn't just collect the signals, there are a few other interesting things happening here. The first one is that often a given smell molecule perfectly fits one receptor, generating a strong signal there, but also weakly fits another receptor, generating a weak signal there. This results in multiple signals to the brain, making it harder to figure out which specific smell this is. To deal with that, the olfactory bulb has so-called inhibitory interneurons, periglomerular cells and granule cells. These connect neurons from different glomeruli. They're inhibitory, so a strong signal here 
will make these cells suppress a weak signal that's coming from there. And so when you start sniffing something, the brain receives spikes only from the glomeruli that have stronger signals and we get a sharper sense of smell. This does not work perfectly. A lot of weakly binding smell molecules will still power through this inhibition and will send spikes to the brain. And the brain will still receive a signal from the wrong glomerulus. We'll see later in this video how the brain deals with that. The granule cells also have another job. They synchronize the spikes going to the brain, which helps the brain process the information more effectively. The last interesting thing I'll mention, although there are many more, is that the brain likes to control the overall strength of your smell. Weaken it when you're sleeping, strengthen it when you're paying attention to the surroundings, and so on. To do that, the olfactory bulb receives a number of long projection neurons from other areas of the brain. And guess where these should connect to control the overall sense of your smell? The inhibitory interneurons. And that's how the brain can adjust the volume on your sense of smell. There is a lot more to tell about the olfactory bulb, but let's keep moving down the system. Alright, so now the brain is getting signals telling it which smell molecules are floating in the air. And now comes what to me is the most interesting part. Recognizing a group of smell molecules as a single combined smell and associating it with an object or a concept. To see how that happens, we need to go to the part of the brain called the piriform cortex, located at the bottom of the brain, deep in these folds over there, one on each side. By the way, these are your two olfactory bulbs, and these are the neurons connecting them to the brain. Now, we don't know how exactly the piriform cortex works. Human piriform cortex is kinda hard to get to without doing some damage. So with humans, we're stuck with making people sniff weird things, and then measuring the brain activity from outside the skull. But we have also learned quite a bit by sticking electrodes into mouse brains, with the idea that the sense of smell is basic enough that what we learn in mice carries over to humans. So here's what we know. We know that the piriform cortex, the area of the brain that interprets the smells, is split into two parts, front and back. Both receive connections from the olfactory bulb neurons, seemingly randomly distributed. But the front part receives more connections than the back, and then the front forwards a lot of its own neurons to the back. So we think that the smells are first processed in the front part of the piriform cortex, and then in the back part. Experiments indicate that it's the front part of the piriform cortex that tells one group of smell molecules apart from another, but it's the back part that classifies the smells and associates them with specific objects. So how does it do that? Let's take a slice of the piriform cortex and zoom into its side. Piriform cortex has a number of different neurons organized into layers, the top layer being the surface of the brain. The neurons from the glomeruli spread throughout the top of layer 1, where they connect with the pyramidal neurons that have cell bodies in layers 2 and 3. These pyramidal cells are the ones that will combine the smell signals and produce the final output. Some of these connections are stronger than others, and that will later determine which pyramidal cells will react to which combination of smells. These pyramidal neurons then send their output accents to other areas of the brain as well as to each other. In addition, in layer 1, there are inhibitory neurons. These are driven by the cells from the olfactory bulb, and as far as we can tell, they just serve to ensure that all other cells fire spikes only at specific frequencies. And in layer 3, we have another group of inhibitory neurons. These are rather interesting. They're driven by the pyramidal cells and connect back to the pyramidal cells in exactly the right spots to shut them down. And these inhibitory neurons play a very critical role in helping us pick up exactly the right smell signals. More on that in a bit. This is all a simplified picture. There is much more detail to this but it is enough to demonstrate what is our best understanding as of 2020 of how this setup extracts a smell. So here is what happens. First, you inhale. Some of the glomeruli immediately pick up the new scent and fire. These signals travel down the nerves to the piriform cortex and hit some of the pyramidal neurons. 
although only a few get strong enough signals to fire an electric spike. These then provide additional signals to some of the other neurons, giving them just enough voltage to fire spikes of their own. And this set of neurons, together, represents in your brain the smell that is associated with this particular set of chemicals. This information then gets immediately sent to other parts of the brain. But here is a problem. You are still inhaling, and more glomerulus will become excited. But these will get excited because a lot of molecules will be weakly binding to their receptors in large enough numbers to override the filters in the olfactory bulb. If nothing is done, they will excite too many neurons and will overwhelm the initial clean signal. But that's where the inhibitory neurons kick in. Now that the pyramidal cells have fired, the inhibitory neurons fire and shut down the pyramidal cells, preventing them from picking up the noise from the olfactory bulb. And so your consciousness ends up with a clean smell signal. So that's the general shape of our smell processing system. Olfactory sensory neurons detect the molecules and send the electric spikes. The olfactory bulb collects them, cleans them up, and sends them to the brain. And the olfactory cortex in the brain interprets the smells. But we can't complete this discussion without mentioning a separate, parallel smell processing system for pheromones. Pheromones, like smells, are just chemicals floating around in the air. The difference is, while the smells are processed consciously, pheromones hook more directly into instincts and emotions. This pheromone processing system has a separate area for pheromone detection that uses separate receptors, separate nerves, that lead to a separate area of the olfactory bulb, and connect, separately, to the areas of the brain associated with basic emotions. Except in humans, we don't have any of that. Other animals do. Cats, dogs, lizards, horses. But in humans, this system seems to have disappeared long before we became humans. We might have the remains of the organ that detects pheromones. There is some disagreement about that. But either way, there are no neurons going there. And although we have DNA that looks a lot like pheromone receptor genes, these genes never get turned into proteins and are considered to be pseudogenes. So, us humans are stuck with just one smell system. Thank you for watching, and see you next time!